We have a lot of things that we want to share with you, and today's message is just one of them. I want to invite you to come and participate in our services here. Join us here every Sunday morning at 9.30 for our Bible study. We have different speakers that come, and you, I think you'll enjoy them. Matter of fact, today's message is also one of those. I have a special message for you each and every Sunday morning at 10.30 right here at Crossroads, which meets at Theater 3, 2800 Ruth Street and Howell, right here in Uptown Dallas. So. If you have this Sunday off, come and visit with us, and let's go to the service right now. No matter where, you're, where your life is, no matter how bad, no matter how good it is, the biggest thing that can ever happen to you is the fact that you open your, the, the door to your heart and allow Jesus Christ to come in. And he's making a statement here in Luke chapter 6. And I think it's real interesting. You know, we, we think that we do so well. And I read things like this in verse 35. It says, but love your enemies and do good, lending, hoping for nothing in, in, again, in again, and your honor shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. You know, uh, I've had an experience with my house the last, you know, the saga of my house, and it just continues to go on. Uh, and I have purposely decided that I am not going to be upset with this guy because there's no reason to be upset with them. And I got a call this week because, you know, last, the story was last week that he didn't show at the closing. He did a no-show at, at the closing. And I closed 8.30 on Tuesday morning. He was supposed to close at 3. He no-showed. No one could raise him. The lender, the title company, his agent couldn't raise him for three days. He finally shows back up and he wants to buy the house again. So this week he calls and he's groveling with his agent to take him back. She's already fired him. She didn't want anything to do with him because she, she's embarrassed now because she represented him at all these places getting slam dunked, all this stuff done. And uh, I believe if we will honor God's word, you remember I told you that I said God has something better? I said I don't know how it's going to work out. The deal is now, and we'll know tomorrow at five o'clock. <laughs> tomorrow is the, the five o'clock is the, the time his money runs out. He will lose his loan tomorrow at five o'clock. So he's got to make this happen. My agent called me while I was traveling from, I spoke in Baton Rouge and uh, New Orleans this week, and I was driving from New Orleans to Baton Rouge, and she calls me, she said, now don't shoot the messenger. I said, I won't. She said, you know, I told you, I already married she and her husband, and they're wonderful people. and. She said that the buyer is willing to do anything in order to get that house. And I said, okay. I said, first off, I want a $5,000 non-refundable, no excuses, no holes on that money contract that if he walks away from it now, there's something coming out of that. And she said, well, how about some free rent on your house? Because I was gonna have to rent the house back from him, to lease the house back until I found some place. She said, well, let's put uh, till the 29th of this month, because that's what he was originally going to do. And she said, no. I, I said, well, that's going to be a holiday weekend. That's the weekend of the 4th of July. People aren't going to be wanting to rent anything. I said, let's put it till the 7th. And we were hoping for the 1st, looking for the 7th. Passed it by him, and he's giving me till the 29th of July, rent free on the house back. Now all we got to do is just walk him through tomorrow at 5.30. And of course his agent said, you know, there's a lot of time between now and five, or 5 tomorrow afternoon. I said, yeah. But she's sweetening the deal with some cash out of her proceeds if I'll let him have the house. I want him to have the house. 
but love your enemies. And I began to pray for this guy because I said, there's something wrong for him. You know, his family got involved in this house. He's a grown man, never bought a house before. And the biggest thing he's ever done in his whole life. And I kept praying for him and I could almost see his face and I could almost see the turmoil that he was in trying to make a decision. How many of you ever struggled with a decision? He was struggling. Be ye merciful, for your Father is also merciful. Judge not, and you'll not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom, for the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. I told my agent, I said, I said, she said, I, you know, we've, we've had our decision about not selling the house to him. I said, no, I said, I want him to have a house. I said, I want him to have a house. We've sent, we showed the house from Saturday to yesterday 12 times with two go backs, two second looks from two couples. And she said, you know, I said, we can always, always accept a contract. I said, you know, it could be a backup contract. We don't have to do anything till five o'clock tomorrow. But I said, I really want this guy to get the house. I think he's family. I think he's just whatever, having a hard time making a decision. But I told her, I said, I want him to have the house. So we're, we're believing. And you just believe with me tomorrow that by 5 o'clock he will have closed. The right here says, given it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that your word is forever settled in heaven. That there is not one word of this book that can be altered. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you that good things will come. That, Father, that as we worship you this morning and as we give of our offerings this morning, Father, that you cause it to come back on us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, Father, in ways that we don't even know how. So, Heavenly Father, I just give you the praise and the glory for it. You said that you would cause men and women to give it back. So, Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and we give you the glory for it now. In Jesus' name, and everyone said Amen and amen. If you're making out a check this morning, make it out to Crossroads. If you're putting cash in the offering, if you would, please raise your hands. And Neil, who's here, I wasn't expecting Neil to be here. He took his honey to the airport this morning. Now, where is he going? Is he going to Bolivia? Uh, Quito, Ecuador. Quito, Ecuador. Okay. And he's going to be gone, what, two weeks? Three. Three weeks. You got the house to yourself. You'll be batching it, won't you? Yeah. Got it. Anybody need an envelope? Okay. I am going to be home for the next two and a half weeks. After five weeks on the road, I'm ready to be home. I have had enough of the road. Had enough. That's more speaking days in a row that I've had since 1998. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've done that much traveling. I am ready to be home. Ready to be home. And I want to have a party at the house before I sell it. So we'll have a big get-together at the house before. I'm going to trash it, leave it trash. No, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Well, who said that? Who said that? Get out. Come out of me. No, I'm actually, I've already, I've already got my housekeepers coming. They're all, they're all going to take care of the house. We've, I've done some things for him that, you know, that uh, I planted some nice plants for him that are new. And all of the day lilies are blooming now all of my hybrids are blooming so he'll he'll have a nice welcome when he gets there hopefully it'll be sooner than later I actually told him I said uh, that if I found a place that I actually went looking yesterday and the place I wanted came on the available Friday and my agent and I were going to look at it yesterday at three o'clock and somebody put a contract on it nine o'clock yesterday morning but I said you know what rejection is not that Rejection really is project, protection. God's got something better. And I'm just now looking and it'll be okay. Last week, last week we were talking about choices and uh, about backbone. And I want to read a couple of scriptures from last week, kind of bringing us forward to this week. Uh, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have said before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose what? Life. life, that both you and your seed may live, 
Then again, it's kind of repeated again in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. If it seemed to be evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day who you will serve, whether the gods or your father, which served that which was on the other side of the flood, or the god or the Amorites, or in the land you dwell in. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And it's talking about decisions. And I, I guess over the last few weeks, overall, this process of selling a house and looking for a new place and uh, believing that you heard God and you're, you know, I, I, I still know that, that God told me to sell the house, so I'm selling the house, regardless. And uh, I, I just kept wondering, you know, God, what do you have in store? What is next? And I thought it was very interesting. He said, you know, I'm in no hurry. I said, well, that's good. <laughs> and I kept thinking about what, uh, what we've been talking about. Keith has been leading us in Sunday school, you know, when he was talking about creation, you know, a day is a thousand years to God. Well, you know, that day, you know, when he says he's really not worried about taking a lot of time, that could be a lot of time to us here on this earth, and I have to just decide I'm not going to worry about it. And I just think it's interesting that for the, one of the first few times in my life, and I think those of you who have known me over the years, know I'm pretty A-type about just about everything. And not knowing where I'm gonna live and not knowing all of that right now has been a real challenge to my understanding about how big God really is. Because I think if he could tell me three weeks from now, he could tell me today, but he hasn't chosen to do that. So, you know, I just, I, I, I think if he already knows, why, why keep it a secret, you know, kind of a deal. Let everybody know. Uh, but anyway, I want you to take a look with me. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter nine. Or if you got your little electronic ones with you, you can turn to Luke chapter 9. And if we hadn't had technical pro problems this morning, I would have had the scripture up on, on the screen for you this morning. But we had a little issue this morning, but we got it all fixed. It was all okay. I want you to continue to pray for Dab David and Chad. They are going to, they're, uh, I've spoken to them this week. They're, they're doing better, but we just need to continue to pray that God is the, the center of their life. That's what we need to pray. Uh, this is a story that probably most of you have heard before. This is a story of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And we're going to start reading here in verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Of course, it doesn't say where the beggar was buried or what happened to him. But this guy was buried. In Hades, in Hades where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus by his side. And so he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over there to us. He answered, I beg of you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. You know, if you won't send him to take a little drop of water to cool my tongue, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers, and let him warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said to him, no, no, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced if even if someone rises from the dead. You know, I, I think it takes a lot to convince people today. I, I think we're living in a day and age where you know, when you read the study between uh, Laodicea and Philadelphia, the two churches that are in the last two churches in the book of Revelation out of those seven, 
It talks about Laodicea being one that uh, had everything going for it. It had uh, ISAF for the eyes. It had the best doctors. Everybody was well off. It was, you know, sort of like we live today. But then there was the church that was parallel with that, that gave, took care of everybody that was the church of you know, Philadelphia, brotherly love, and all of the wonderful things that you could see going on there because they cared for each other. And yet at this other place, nobody cared for anybody, but they were kind of selfish. And what I think is interesting is, is that we live pretty much in that same day today. And there's that parallel going. And my thought is, who is going to be able to convince those people that are around us that we are in the last days? Who's going to be able to tell them where they will be convinced. I was thinking about the Old Testament. We were kind of thinking about that this morning and the fact that when God delivered Abraham, Moses and the, the children of Israel, out of, uh, the Hebrew children, out of Pharaoh's hand, there were miracle after miracle after miracle. God had not been seen for 400 years, had not been heard from for four years. All of a sudden, there is a wave of the supernatural power of God. God is showing himself right and left in all of this stuff. They get out of that place and they no sooner get out there that we talked about it last week where they tasted the bitter waters and they want to go back. They can't even hold to a, a, a belief that was so miraculous, so powerful, so demonstrative that God revealed himself in many, many ways to this group of people who were really in pain, in torment, who had been there for 400 years, had families, had lived and died in the mud, literally, making bricks for Pharaoh. And they get away from that place, and now they want to go back. They are ready to renege on their decision, and they've just been out a few days. What a terrible way to be. To have liked something that was so bad when you're faced with something, yeah, you don't know what it is, but so far it's been a pretty good ride. I mean, and then you think about the fact that every single day, God supplied them with manna every single day. He said, now don't worry about needs. I'm gonna supply all of your needs. Don't hoard this. And he had to show them in another miracle that the next day, that which they kind of scooped up to kind of hold off because they had been starved. It's like people who are on the street and when they finally get around food, they start hoarding it. Not that it isn't available to them, but that's just the natural instinct because they've been in so much lack that they just hold on to stuff. But here is a group of people who God has shown us of one thing after another, who's provided water for a million people every day, food every day, a fire by night, a cloud by day to lead them I mean, miracle after miracle after miracle, and they still can't decide, hmm, God or Egypt? God or Egypt? So my, I guess my question is, what is it gonna take in a generation like ours to get our folks to realize that God loves them? You know, there are so many voices out there that proclaim so much bad stuff that you just wonder, how much are you going to have to share? There's a Sunday school teacher that was teaching on this, this lesson here. And she asked the little boy, now which one of these people would you rather be? Would you rather be the rich man who goes to hell? Or would you rather be Lazarus who doesn't have any money, but he goes to heaven? And the little boy said, well, I like to be the rich man while I die, when I'm alive and Lazarus when I'm dead. <laughs> People want to eat the cake and eat it too. You know, want the cake and eat it too. And I think that's a lot of what I see today. I see, people, I see people wanting an easy spiritual life but not willing to put the time in it to get it. You were talking about a relationship this morning. You know, if I were in a relationship with someone, I could not live with them and not communicate with them. I couldn't do that. I couldn't just let them go and do whatever they wanted to do 
and not feel like there is any connectivity between me and them at all and never have any communication and just both parties. I mean, that's like roommates. It's not even roommates. You know, you're just going and doing stuff. But if you're going to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I think that has to happen every day. I think that has your, your communication with him has to be of an importance. I was seeing somebody for a short while and I'm, I'm a very attentive kind of person. I like to give someone my attention. If I'm in, in, enthralled with them, I like them to know that. I like to do things for them, buy things, cards, whatever. And while I was doing this, I didn't get anything back. And my thought was, if I'm just an option to him, then I'm certainly not the one for him. You see, I don't think God can be an option if we're going to have a relationship with him. I think we have to be at that place where there are no options. If I'm in a situation that I, it's beyond my own capability to do, then I've got to make a choice that, you know what, I am in this relationship and that he is worthy of saying, you know what, can you help in this? Can you help in this? If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and follow me. You know, and I, I just want us to kind of consider some choices this morning. There was a young man trying to marry his high school sweetheart, and he kept proposing, kept proposing, kept proposing, and she kept saying, no, no, no. And her thought to herself was, is there anyone else out there? Certainly there has to be somebody else besides this guy who wants me. See, I don't think God wants that out of us. I think God wants us not to look at him. Is there anybody else out there that can help me? You know, it's the, like the guy that fell off the cliff and he was holding on to a branch that was coming out of the side of this mountain and it was broken and it was pulling away. And he kept calling out, is, can somebody help me? And God said, I'll help you. And he kept saying, is there anybody else out there? You know, we've heard the story about the people that were stuck on the top of the roof and there was a flood coming and the boat came by and they were, you know, the, obviously they needed help and people in the boat said, well, why don't you get in? We'll help you get out of this terrible place. No, 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 we're, we're waiting for some people. We're waiting for some people. And here comes a helicopter wanting to load somebody down and pick them up. And they kept saying, no, we're waiting, we're waiting for somebody. Well, God had sent two people to rescue them. Who are they waiting on? I think... When you get into a bad situation, there are choices to make. Are you going to go with your natural thought process? Are you going to lean on the arm other than your understanding? You know, I have been too much a very mental kind of guy. And walking into a new space that is not mental, not seeing, not knowing, not being able to peer and kind of have some inkling of what's next has been a different story for me. But I will tell you, it's exciting. You know, I think choices are, are, are terrible to make. Uh, we're talking about this young guy, you know, who, wanting to buy the house. I don't know what's going on in his head. I, I can't imagine the turmoil that he's in that has caused him this kind of anguish where he can't make a decision. It's like the lady who had three children and walked into the ice cream store, and she asked, what kind of ice cream do you have? And he says, we have chocolate and vanilla. She said, is that all? And the guy said, ma'am, you don't know how hard it is for people to make up their decision between these two, chocolate or vanilla. So what I want us to think about today is if you've had a miracle in your life, do you really have a choice on who you're going to be in a relationship with? Turn over at Luke chapter 6. We were just there, but we're going to back up just a little bit. You see, I believe that when you're given a directive and God gives you a choice, it really is your choice. I think Lazarus made that choice. I think the rich man made that choice. I don't think, they, I don't think the rich man was happy with his conclusion. It certainly doesn't appear to be that way. But those choices that we do make have consequences. Uh, I've told you this story once before where 
my second oldest daughter had run away and it was a terrible thing. It was Halloween. It was like, oh, what year was it? It had to have been like 1994, 95, something like that. And there had been a rash of abductions of teenage girls here in the city and it was terrible and we came home, couldn't find her and were just distraught, called the police. My thought was, you know, where are they? And the other two girls said, we can't tell you, we can't tell you, we, we promised we wouldn't tell you. And I said, you know, it'll be terrible if something happens to her and you had knowledge and you didn't share that. So she finally told us, and I've told you the story, came up behind her and she got into the car and she said that she just didn't feel like she could talk to anybody because we were so connected and her par grandparents were so connected, been on television. She said, we, I don't have anybody to talk to that doesn't know you. And I said, well, I can fix that. Are you familiar with ADAPT? Okay, anyway, there is a, uh, a counseling center here in Dallas called ADAPT and it's, it's, it's uh, secular counseling and it wasn't that that was my pick but I thought that that would be so far removed from where we had been that it would give her confidence that anything that she had to say wouldn't be shared under any, any guise at all. So she went and we were talking about it because we had a couple of three or four weeks later with everybody in the family, all dynamics and everything. And the counselor said to her, you know, those decisions, because she was upset with me because I grounded her. And I said, the counselor was trying to get her to understand that our choices have consequences. And we may not always like them. But they really are a learning tool. And here we find this scripture. It said, and it came to pass also, in verses 6, I'm sorry, Luke 6, 6 and 7. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath, Jesus was always doing things outside the normal. You weren't supposed to do anything on the Sabbath, but he was always healing people just to drive the, the clergy of the time, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the priests and the rabbis, just to drive them nuts. He said it was on another Saturday, and he, and he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was with it. So he was doing this in church with a church full of people, folks. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him. Now, Jesus is seeing this young guy who's had this withered hand. He's in wanting to know about God. He wants a relationship with God. He wouldn't be in church if he didn't want that. And Jesus seeing that, and he's looking at the opportunities. Should I heal him and do the right thing? Or should I not heal him and do the right thing in the eyes of all these people? And we have that today. We have that today. Do I stand up for what I believe because I really have a gut sincerity about it? Or do I tell my friends, no, I can't go to brunch with you on Sunday because I'm going to church. I can't do that because I'm going to a Bible study. I can't do that because it's, it's not as easy to go to a small church as it is to a large church. It's not, it's not comfortable to do that. I think there's a lot of things that we make decisions on because of the look-arons by other people. But I think it's interesting Jesus went up to the young man and said, reach forth your hand. And the young man made the choice. He made the choice for Jesus and for all those people around him. That's the thing though. If we don't give people the choice to say, you know, I think it's great if you want to go to brunch, but you know what? I think something would be better for you in the long run would be for you to go with me to church. So why don't you just come and go with me to church? And give them the choice, but we're afraid to ask because of what they might think. Well, you know what? I don't care what they think. In, in the guise of Lazarus and the rich young man here, I think if we don't tell them, then we have something to be responsible for later down the line. And the consequences, I think, are not going to be, I don't think we're going to be condemned, but I think, you know what, I think God has disappointed us when we don't do the right thing and we have the opportunity to do it.
it's like, why don't people give? You know, I've, I've, I've been a pastor for 32 years now, and I, I guess the thing that has always amazed me is the excuses people use not to give. Oh, I've got this bill to pay. Well, who generated that bill? Uh, I've got a car payment. Well, who picked that kind of car? I've got, you know, this to pay. I've got this to pay. Well, all those things were self-generated. They didn't just happen with, with life. But then it comes down to this choice, Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The choice comes down to, do you believe that or not? You see, if you're going to be a believer, what are you gonna believe in? Are you gonna say, you know what? Oh, I'm going to give as soon as I get some money. I had somebody to tell me that says, as soon as they made their first million dollars, they were going to give $100,000 to the church. I said, well, I think that's great. How much money you got in your billfold right now? And they opened it up and they told me how much it was. I said, then give 10% of that right now. If you give $100,000 out of a million, give 20 out of the 200 that you got in your pocketbook. But people can't do that. But my thought is, do you believe Philippians 4.19? Because I've heard you quote that to other people, but do you believe it enough to act on it? 3 John 1, 2, it's one of my favorite verses. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Does God want you well? Does God want you well? <coughs> yes or no? Yes. How do we know that? His word says so. So if his word says, I want you well above all things, then I think, you know what? I think he really means all things. I think if he really meant for me to prosper, I think that he really meant for me to prosper. I don't think it's God's wishes that anyone live without. I don't. I think that if we believe all things are possible, we sing that song. <coughs> Take a look with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 28. But you see, it takes backbone to make choices that have consequences to them. The consequences of believing in tithing is that somewhere I'm going to give up 20, I'm going to give up that $20 out of 200, and I'm going to believe God to live on the 180 better than I lived on the 200 before I gave the 10%. J.C. Penney. I thought it was very interesting when you read the life of the, the story of his life, he gave away 90% and lived on 10%. I thought that was pretty interesting. But I know people who can't give and still can't afford because they don't believe that God's going to supply all their needs. So they hoard because they don't think they're going to have enough. I think I told you this story of my dad. My dad was a tither. I mean, from the time I was a kid, I mean, First Baptist Church in Wichita Falls, I mean, my family were there. I told you that I was born in that church. I actually was. Uh, the Wichita Falls General Hospital was bought by the First Baptist Church to turn into their children's department. And I can actually tell people I was born in the church and tell them the truth. I was. But they have been there their whole lives. And when they were doing a big thing on redoing the sanctuary, my parents gave a lot of money. It scared me that they could give that kind of money. But they gave it. So I know that my parents were really givers. And I know that they really taught my sister and I to do that. And I look at my sister today, and y'all just keep her in your prayers. I mean, she's coming home in September. She's coming back from the Philippines in September. So. Uh, she'll be here for a couple of weeks. She's got to get her, she's got to get out of the country to get a visa to go back in to enter, say, another year and a half. So she'll be home. But my sister will tell you that in the light of having really nothing, really having nothing, she's happier today than she's ever been in her whole life. Being a missionary to those boys in Manila has been the joy of her life. When she was here the last time, she kept telling me, I can't wait to get home. 
I can't wait to get home. The boys miss me. That she'd be Facebooking them. And she said, the boys miss mom and I gotta get home. She doesn't wanna come home because this isn't her home anymore. And I watch her every month. I watch what goes into her checking account because I sign on all of her, all of her accounts and I manage them for her. And I see the amount of money that goes into her account. It's her social security from her husband, her late husband. She gets his, which is higher than what hers would be. So she gets that money every month. She pays for the compound house that they live in. It's a three-story house. It's not like palatial by any means. It's just three stories. In fact, it's got a lower floor that you don't do anything with because I think I've told you that the water and the floods have been up to the top of the second floor. So they don't live anything. Nothing goes on down there. They park cars and their bicycles and they play basketball downstairs and that's about it. Come up and they have the living on the second floor and then they have bedrooms on the third floor. But then on top is like a big roof where they spend the nights out because they don't have air conditioning. So everybody sleeps up on the roof and I can't imagine doing that because I can't imagine the mosquitoes and all the stuff that's up there, but they do, that's what they do, and they have fans that blow on them all night long. My sister, who never lived in a life like that, lives like a life like that today, and is happier there than anywhere else because she made a choice that she was gonna do what God called her to do. And I watch and see how she meticulously managed that small, meager amount of money every month to take care of the house, pay the utilities, put food on, on the table for 10 people every month. And I am amazed. And she still gives to other missionaries there. I said, Martha, you're a missionary. She says, I know, but it's got to work for me too. So you have to make choices. But those choices are you learn and you do the right thing. Here in Deuteronomy chapter 28, you're gonna start reading with verse 14. With verse one, we're gonna go down to 14. I'm reading out of the NIV here. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all of his commandments I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. And see, I think obeying is, is, a, is an option. I don't think you have to. He's not making you do that. But he's saying if you do, there are going to be certain blessings. And verses starting with 15 through the end are the consequences of not doing it, not believing. All these bad things will happen to you. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and your young, the young of your livestock and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trowel will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. I say that every day. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction but will flee in seven. The Lord will set a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to do. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given, he is giving you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you an oath. Either he did that or he didn't, folks. Either he promised that and the Bible says that he is not a, a man that he should lie. Either he has promised you all of this and it is your choice to believe it and receive it or not and not. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him, then all the people of the earth will see that you're called by his Call by the name of the Lord and they will fear you, reverence you, honor you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. The fruit of your womb, the, the, long, the young of your livestock and the crops of your ground and the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open the heavens and the storehouse of his bounty to send rain on your land. Thank you, Jesus, for the rain today. In season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. 
I think it's interesting when he makes that statement. He really means that. I think when people get into credit card debt, they don't realize that they are now a servant to the system and that God never intended that. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commandments of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commandments I give you today to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. Following other gods or yourself. But see, I think it's a choice. And those choices are, just like what we talked about last week, the backbone to make a decision and to then stick with it. Through thick or thin. Whether we see the results of what we've asked for or not. I think the hardest thing to do for people today is to say, I believe in God even in the spite of bad things coming. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We talked about that last week. They made a decision that they weren't going to serve the gods of Nebuchadnezzar. They weren't going to worship the idols. And look what happened to them. They got thrown into the fiery furnace. But did they suffer from it? And the answer is no. Matter of fact, the fiery furnace was what loosed their, the bonds on them. And I think the bonds on what? The bonds on their thinking about how big God is and the fact that they were in that fiery furnace that had killed the people that had thrown them in and yet they're walking around in it and Jesus is on the inside there with them. So I guess I would rather be in the most difficult place on earth knowing that Jesus was there with me than in the finest palace and have his absence known to me. What choices do we make? I think they need to be informed choices. I think we need to know what God's word says and then find out how can we get that to work in our lives every single day. But I think every day we are faced with decisions of do we believe or not? And my, my word to you today is, you know what? Do you have a choice? Look at the option. I mean, there is not a good option. God makes it very plain. This is the way to go. Look here. Follow me. Look at the abundance I'm putting you in. Look at the health I'm putting you in. Look at the, look at the relationships that I'm going to help build you around. Ones that are going to serve and take care of each other, that are going to love and nurture each other. That's the kind of environment I want for you. I don't want somebody to be in an environment where everybody's pulling on and cheating and drawing from. I want you to be a place where I'm fulfilling you and every person's need in that place. How can you make a decision and turn around from that? I don't know. There's plenty of pattern in the Bible where people were saved by God and healed and still turned away. You know, I think about the 10 lepers. Here are 10 lepers that have been in a bad state all this time. Jesus heals all 10 but only one come back to thank him. It's a life of thanksgiving. It's a life of honoring that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a time, of, a, a decision to say, you know what? This relationship is above every other relationship that I have. That I choose to honor this every day by spending time with the person who takes such good care of me I can't do anything but do that. I want to spend time with him. I find myself every day wanting to read more and more of his love letter to me. Because this is what he talks to me about. This is what he says he's going to do for me. So all the cards you can send to people in the world don't make a bill make a hill of beans. They just don't make any difference at all compared to the one that Jesus wrote and signed with his own blood. So the choice is do we believe this or not? Have you had a miracle? Have you had a life-changing experience? Have you had something happen to you that is unexplainable? That in the natural mind there is no way to explain it. This is what happened and this is what happened. 
either God protected you or did the devil protect you? No, the devil means for bad what God means for good. So the choice is, what are we going to believe? And then what are you going to do and act on what you believe? You see, I think we all know too much to sit and do nothing. The choices are that we have people around us that we have a responsibility to share with them a miracle. You know, they can roll their eyes all they want to. But see, I think that's their decision. It was the, the withered boy's hand. He made that decision. He said, you know what? I see all these people too. I know what they're capable of. I've heard and seen what you've done because I've been in synagogue and you've done this every synagogue day. There was nothing new for Jesus to heal on the Sabbath day. It wasn't anything new. It says it was just another day because he's gone about his father's business healing people. I guess my question is, are you going to do the same thing? Are you going to be about your father's business? Are you going to make a decision and a choice to say, you know what, these things that happened to me are real. They were not just a fluke. They weren't just something that happened. See, I can't say that. When you're healed of cancer twice, you can't just say, well, one of them was a fluke. <laughs> you just can't say that. You either have to believe that the hand of God is on you. I don't know how many of you got an email this week from Carmen, the singer. Anybody familiar with Carmen, the singer, that's been around like for 20, 25 years? He's been diagnosed and, it, you know, he made a decision that, you know, in, in spite of the diagnosis of cancer and four years to live, four to five years to live, that he's not going to back up. He's going to go forward. You see, I think you have to decide, you know what, either God's true and I'm going to be running into that truth or live out here and die. You know, what good is that going to do? What good is that going to do for anybody? So when God's done something for you, don't make it your decision to tell somebody or not. Their action and reaction is their choice. But they need to hear. The New Testament says, how will they hear unless they receive it from a preacher? How are they going to hear it unless you tell them? It's not your decision whether they believe you or not. But it is your decision to tell them or not. And they already know you're crazy, so who cares? <laughs> you know? You've already told them you go to church. Oh my God, you go to church. All that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I would rather be a fool for Christ's sake than anything else. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are faced every day with choices. Some are good, some are not so good. But Father, the choices that we make to be like our elder brother Jesus, to be an example to people, to, in the light of other folks, to do the things that, what's it going to do to me? What, what, what could they say that hasn't already been said and done to you? Our choice is to believe that they need to receive the word. That we sow the word, and Father, we pray that it falls on good ground, and that Father, that it will produce some 160 and 100 fold. Father, but we can't hold on to the seed just because we think about the consequences that other people might say or do, or be in the company of people who might be able to make an influence somewhere down the line, because Father, we serve a God that is the influence of all time. So Heavenly Father, we choose to make an informed choice to follow you and your example. To go about the Father's business, displaying his glory, allowing this earthen vessel to break forth and everywhere we go to spill out your glory on those people that are thirsty for the truth, 
thirsty for a miracle working God, whether they know that's what they're missing or not, it is. There is a God-shaped vacuum on the inside of every person. And Father, only you can fill it up. They might be trying to fill it up with everything else, but only you can place that life-giving force on the inside of them. And Father, it comes at the word of people who have experienced that. So Father, I thank you that every person that's here today, that hears this word today, Father, will make a choice that's not necessarily theirs, but it's yours. That you give every person the choice of life and death. And so Father, all we're to do is to show them the way. Give them the information that they need. Allow them to make an informed choice. So Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and we give you the glory for it now. In Jesus' name, and everyone said Amen. Don't think the choice is yours. You got to open your mouth. You got to let them make the choice. No matter what company you're in, if you're at JR's, you're at the Roundup, you're at Palomino's for brunch, doesn't make any difference. Well, what are people going to say? You know what? Who cares what they say? They're already talking about you. Let, give them something really good to talk about you about, right? You go and have a wonderful week this week. Have a wonderful blessed day. And if you need me, I'm at home this week. You can call. You got my number. And uh, we're glad to have you visiting with us today. Bless you. Hope you come back. Do you live in the city? You do. Hi, and thank you for watching today's service. As I spoke to you at the beginning, we have a couple of outreaches, which I think are important for you to know that we're participating in. And you might want to join us. We've got one, which is our orphanage in Uganda. It's 320 children, about, that have been left there because their parents have either died or are affected by HIV AIDS. There are no relatives that will take them in because it's such a stigma to have HIV or even to be gay there in Uganda. We also have a church in Tegucigalba, Honduras. It's just a starting work, but there is a lot that we can do to help them. And if you'd like to join and be a part of that, we invite you to go to our webpage, www.crossroadscommunitychurch.us, and you'll see a tab there that says donation. You can make your donation through PayPal. It's secure, and we'll get that, and we'll send it on to them. So if you'd like to participate, we thank you for doing it in advance because we know that God is going to bless you. Thank you for watching today, and tune in next week. Believe it.